Welcome back to our second panel for the day, uh, where we'll be examining what the future may hold uh, in terms of how we recognize refugees. Uh, I'm Daniel Gesselbash, I'm the Deputy Director of the Caldor Center, and it's uh, my great privilege to moderate this discussion alongside this very distinguished panel. Uh, joining me today, uh, we have online on the screen from Berlin in, in the very early hours of the morning, Catherine Costello, who is a professor of law at the University of College Dub Dublin and one of the world's preeminent uh, scholars of international refugee law and migration law. Um, and Catherine's leading not one but two big international uh, research projects that are very closely related to the topic of the discussion today. The first one being REFMIG, which looks at the different approaches around the world to how states recognize refugees, and the AFAR project, which is looking at uh, algorithmic fairness for asylum seekers and refugees. Um, and on the stage, we have Shahyo Roshan, who is a senior member and the national practice leader on protection in the Migration and Refugee Division of Australia's Administrative Appeals Tribunal, um, and brings 20 years of practical experience uh, doing the exact task that we'll be focusing on, which is uh, recognizing refugees um, for the discussion today. Well, we also have Edward Santo, Industry Professor and Director of Policy and Governance at the Human Technology Institute, uh, which he co-founded at uh, UTS, and Australia's former Human Rights Commissioner. Uh, he, a, a long time and tireless advocate for the rights of refugees, uh, and uh, he's also set uh, the agenda when it comes to um, the regulation of AI and technology in Australia, both in his uh, previous and current role. And Neve Kinchin, who is an um, acting dean and associate professor at uh, the University of Wollongong, and one of the leading experts on the intersection of technology and migration, and in particular, the role of technology and AI in refugee status determination procedures. Um, and you can find more detailed bias for all our speakers on the conference program. Now, now let's turn to the video that will be uh, set up the scenario, this, the provocation for today's discussion. It is 2033, and the factors driving people from their homes are becoming increasingly complex and interconnected. Persecution, armed conflict, the impacts of climate change and disasters, growing food insecurity and human rights violations intersect to create mixed movements of people in search of international protection, livelihood opportunities, and a more dignified existence. In this context, the task of distinguishing those eligible for international protection from those who are not has become increasingly challenging. Across both the global north and south, access to robust, individualised refugee status determination procedures is the exception rather than the rule, with governments adopting a variety of measures aimed at increasing efficiency in the face of increased protection claims and extended backlogs. This includes an increased reliance on group determination, where applicants from certain countries with specific characteristics are granted protection, while other groups are automatically denied. Faster decision-making is also supported by widespread use of AI and other technologies. Machine learning algorithms are used to stream and allocate applications to different procedures based on an assessment of a case's complexity and the likelihood of success. Biometrics are used to establish identity and AI tools analysing facial micro-expressions, body language, eye movements and voice are employed to assess the credibility of an applicant. Additional data collected through digital forensics, such as social media analysis, are factored into the decision-making process. AI systems synthesize all collected data to provide a recommendation as to whether the applicant meets the legal criteria for protection. Final decisions, however, still involve human oversight. Meanwhile, new actors have become involved in determining protection claims. Private corporations are involved in designing and implementing refugee status determination procedures and assistive technologies. At the same time, 
there has been a significant increase in the number of states with functioning asylum systems. These are the result of successful efforts to incentivize states in the Global South to establish new national asylum systems, which have been supported through the transfer of resources and technology. This has reduced the role UNHCR plays in processing asylum claims, allowing it to hand over responsibility to national governments. Before we unpack the various elements of the scenario, Shahir, if I can hand over to you uh, to maybe take a step back and provide some reflections on what values should guide the des design of asylum systems. I think, of course, the fundamental and the foremost value is fairness, and in the context of the work that I do, which is decision making, it's uh, procedural fairness. And that's a set of rules and principles that have developed uh, over time in law to ensure that decision makers uh, make decisions fairly. Uh, that, of course, involves <clears throat> uh, applicants having the right to present their case and challenge evidence, and more importantly, to be able to appeal adverse decisions. Uh, it also must involve uh, de bias adjudication and for applicants to be able to uh, present their case coherently in the sense that they understand the issues. And of course, this concept of fairness um, would uh, involve many other um, elements uh, that I won't get into, and I'll probably defer to my fellow panelists. Thanks so much, Shahya. Um, Catherine, do you want to come in here? We have something to add on the, the values that should guide the design of asylum systems? Um, sure. I, I mean, I think that's a beautiful summary of uh, an understanding of fairness in this kind of adjudicatory setting. Uh, but I think there are other values that matter. Um, in particular, you know, if we want to ensure that swift, accurate decisions are taken, which means actually avoiding appeals. <laughs> And if we look at it uh, from that point of view, I think uh, efficiency does matter, both for claimants and for states. Um, but I also think we need a wider lens on um, individual rights in asylum procedures, because often the harms that are done to applicants um, aren't only the harm of being treated unfairly, but often um, there are epistemic injustices of disbelief that aren't always captured in formal understandings of fairness from a legal point of view. Um, and also a lot of harms like violations of privacy and dignity. Uh, there's a very important EU case acknowledging that um, evidential methods of assessing or ostensibly uh, assessing sexual orientation were a, a straightforward violation of human dignity and didn't generate any evidence of probative value. And uh, unfortunately, a lot of the practices in asylum are like that. I mean, they're based on junk science or prejudices. So I think we need a wider lens, too, on individual dignity and in particular privacy when we think about, especially we're going to be talking about data as well. So I agree absolutely fairness, procedural fairness is a key value, but I think we also have to keep efficiency in the mix and a wider lens on individual uh, human dignity. So I think that's a, a very useful grounding for us to start, start on um, and build on in terms of assessing the the risks and opportunities that are posed by the scenario. And, and you know, one of the problems the scenario, or the challenges the scenario deals with is you know, grappling with an increased number of asylum claims and you know, foresees a, a very large role in the use of technology in the pursuit of efficiency. And um, so, so Neva, I can hand over, hand over to you, just so we're on the same page, if you could explain sort of the various technologies and the applications that are set out in, in the scenario, that would be very helpful. Yeah, absolutely, thank you. And I have to start by saying that this is very much a moving feast. It's quite difficult to keep on top of all the new technologies that are emerging. So I may, of course, miss some and you may know some of others as well. But I thought it would be good to speak about this technology in a continuum in relation to the process of refugee status determination, starting actually before displacement. So before displacement, what we are seeing is the increase of, increase of what we call forecasting tools that are relying on big data in a way to predict movements across international borders. Um, have an example from the European Asylum Support Office. 
they've developed something called early warning and preparedness system. And what they do is they draw on four sources of data. Um, so for example, Frontex data, a lot of you know Frontex, the border agency in Europe, um, Google Trends, their own, their own information, and then try to predict when the next movement will be using indicators such as um, you know, the likelihood of war or conflict or even a pandemic, and then providing those stats. So that's even before we get to, um, we get to uh, actually coming into the registration process. And I should say broadly, uh, the, also the surveillance tech that's being used in places like the Mediterranean, you know, so drones, et cetera, are also um, part of this story. When we come to the registration process, so this is the pre-refugee status determination process, um, one interesting thing that we'll be talking about more is, is streaming and triaging and questioning whether there's actually automatic streaming happening in the asylum context. As far as I can see, I'm not aware of anything that's happening automatically, in, but it is happening in the migration space. So we have to be careful about watching what's happening there. Uh, the UK, a couple of years ago, piloted a program which was like a traffic light system and it was like uh, for their visitor visas. So red light stop, orange maybe, green go. And one of the indicators for the traffic light system was nationality. So it's important to watch that kind of thing. Um, in relation to registration, of course, this is where we really look at biometrics. UNHCR have been using biometrics for registration for asylum seekers since 2002. Since 2013, we have the Biometric Identity Management System, BIMS, which is where they collect biometric data, such as, of course, um, facial images, fingerprints, iris scans, and put them into the records uh, as a way to recording identity. That's actually currently used really widely. I think it's, uh, last I looked, and it could even be broader, is over, it's used in over 60 unique operations, the most recent countries to come on board, Chile and Panama. Um, and UNHCR are quite, I'm not sure where they're at with this, but moving towards a digital ID is something that they've certainly been discussing. Also use of apps for registering to before you go across the border. And here I'm particularly looking at the United States. They have something called the CP1 app, which um, before asylum seekers cross the southern border, they're supposed to register on the app. Um, so that's something that's happening there. Moving from registration into the refugee status determination space, uh, there's a few things going on, first of all, here. So, of course, this is the part where we have the decision-making for refugees, an important part of this, and what our scenario contemplates is in relation to credibility assessment interviews, that process. So I can start with that. How is or is AI being used in the interview process in the sense of we have algorithms that are about emotion recognition, and they are being used in other circumstances, such as like HR recruitment. We're seeing automated interviewing. Um, it's not clear to me that it's being used yet, like in the state, pure AI in an asylum interview process. We did see a rise in virtual interviewing across the pandemic. Um, but where I have seen this, it's really interesting. Some of you might be aware of a very, co very controversial project a few years ago called iBorder Control, which uh, was, in, was in Europe and set up sort of like an avatar system which judged a whole lot of indicators as to whether someone could cross a border, uh, biometric verification, but uh, document authentication, risk assessment, but also deception detection. So using algorithms as a way to actually determine whether someone is lying, i.e. credibility, which are not the same thing at all. So there are things happening that we have to watch. Speech and language seems to be something that's increasingly being used in credibility assessment, um, being very much driven by Germany in particular, but other European states as well. So what we see there, name transliteration. So when uh, taking names that are not in the Latin alphabet and um, translating them into the Latin alphabet, Obviously, to understand the name, but there is also a drive or a, a motivation there to identify where that person came from, as in what region or area, according to that process. There is also speech and dialect recognition in asylum procedures. Again, since 2017, Germany has started testing a tool for that. So the idea is that I'm speaking, 
Uh, say I'm speaking to you now and you might have an idea of where I came from, maybe in Sydney, et cetera. That's sort of what the tool is doing. Um, and Turkey also did a, a pilot of this as well. We also see Italy using speech-to-text technology where they're automatically translating um, the interview in the accredibility assessment to text and then synthesising that with, like, the audio and visual recording of the interview. Mobile phone data and analysis is something that, again, again, Germany is leading the way on this, but other places as well, where the contents of digital devices, uh, particularly the metadata, is being reviewed in order to provide a report for the purpose of credibility assessment. So in Germany, where someone doesn't have a passport um, or refuses to hand over, say, documents, then if they don't hand them over, then it can have a negative impact, I understand, on the asylum application. Now, what they're looking for in that data are things like um, country codes of contacts, um, uh, languages that were used in the incoming and outcoming messages, um, country endings of the browsing history, login names for social media, and, of course, geodata, which is um, shouldn't be something that factors into credibility, RSD, but is, like, the journey is going to be factoring in. Now, I should mention, in Australia, um, in the Customs Act, in, in the Migration Act, the ABF, Australian Border Force, does have the ability or the power to seize your digital devices and inspect them and take copies of them without a warrant. Um, and so, in the migration space, I believe that that is used where a person is going to have their visa cancelled. But that power is there. So, whether that, again, is moved into the asylum um, context, we, we may say. And uh, fraud detection. So, fraud detection, this can apply to digital documents, but also paper documents. That's being used quite expansively in the Netherlands. So, using algorithms to detect possible fraud and identity documents. I don't know that that's being used in asylum yet, but uh, I know that there are a lot of issues, as I'll talk to you about risks in relation to documentation. And then we come to automated decision-making itself. So this is when we're talking about, does the algorithm play a part in actually making decisions about asylum, and could the algorithm make a, take, play a part in that? I think the Migration Act was mentioned in the last panel. There is the power to do this in the migration. It has been there for some time, as in it's, there's a power for a machine uh, to make a decision. Um, there's a lot of questions around that, but there's, there's certainly a power to make that. Um, as I understand it, and if anyone knows this differently, I'd really like to hear, but as I understand it, the migration, uh, well, the agency, the department, is only using automated decisions at the moment for auto, um, auto grants, so where there is a positive outcome and where it's a non-complicated case. But that doesn't mean that it can't expand into asylum or more vulnerable uh, situations. Um, so... Yeah, uh, I think the other one that I really wanted to mention is the Netherlands are trialling a system called... It's essentially a case matcher system. So this is a tool that enables caseworkers to find out about applications made on similar grounds by making a search on all the cases. Um, so it's actually... It's essentially text mining, text analysis, and then ranks the cases and documents and then scores them, I believe. Um, so it's based on... So what I wanted to say is it's not a machine learning algorithm. So machine learning would actually be training itself on... It would be trained... The algorithm would be trained on previous data to then um, identify patterns and correlations where this is more just a text matching. That said, Canada, a number of years ago, was trialling a system. And again, I'd love to hear if anyone knows about where Canada's up to with this, because they were certainly very interested in um, looking at predictive analytics for certain parts of migration decision making, including asylum. And we were all looking at them, but I'm not sure whatever information or where they're at with that. So it's something I, I feel I need to have a look at. Um, yeah, so that's probably the main ones that I would unpack for now. Yeah. Thank you, Neve. And um, that's... Um, no a really good overview of where we're at now. Uh, but you know, taking the, the scenario and the sort of expansion, widespread expansion of these te technologies, uh, what, what risks do they pose in that context? Yeah, so, I mean, this is a big discussion, so I'll, I'll do my best to bring this into, uh, synthesise it as much as possible. Um, increased border surveillance. So forecasting 
If you get forecasting and you decide or you're trying to work out when people are going to cross the border, then those borders are going to be surveilled more. Uh, so that's pretty, a pretty clear one. Discrimination, there's the risk of discrimination in a number and in equity and in number of these, uh, these technologies. So first of all, if, if we do go to automatic streaming and triaging, I know this is going to be talking about, but you know, I mentioned before that in the UK visa system, one of the indicators was nationality. So if that then becomes indicators of nationality, then we are probably going to see some discrimination in that process. Credibility interviews, um, this is a big one. It, whether AI has a space, it has a place in this or not, but there is certainly risk of discrimination and that the algorithm will maintain and amplify inequity and discrimination that's already there based on race, ethnicity and gender. So we've already seen these issues around facial recognition, et cetera, in other areas. And so I can't imagine, and assumptions as well, that that wouldn't translate in some way also, the, the thing is, I don't know if, despite we call it our emotion recognition algorithms, I'm not sure how well algorithms can detect trauma. And trauma um, impacts the way memory, impacts memory and then presentation of that memory. So there's a big gap there. In relation to automated decision making, this totally depends on where the algorithm would be. Like, you know, if it's, if it's just a very small part, if it's all of it. So I'll say that first, but there's a couple of issues here. First of all, there's a, what we would call a feedback loop problem. So this is where you've got previous outputs are used as inputs. And so then where previous outputs were based on bias and discrimination, they're then used to inform the algorithm, which then embeds and entrenches that bias and discrimination. And they could be on factors such as nationality, but also on the other uh, nexus grounds for um, refugee status, such as religion, etc. cetera. Um, another one that I'm really interested with and I've been thinking a lot about is how algorithms will deal with the issue of well-founded fear. So we know that in order to uh, be um, determined as a refugee, or have your refugee status determination, there needs to prove that there's a well-founded fear of discrimination. Well-founded fear has two elements. One is an objective fear, and one is a subjective fear. So in actual fact, we could talk about maybe the AI and tech is gonna maybe have some really interesting benefits for objective fear, especially in the way we might bring in and synthesize country of origin information and keep that up to date. But how is it gonna deal with subjective fear when it's being trained on somebody else's fear? And so uh, that, that's, a, that's a big issue that I see. I don't know that it's gonna get across. And then we end up going back to credibility assessment interviews. Um, privacy and data abuse, I think Catherine talked about this, is, is actually obviously, it's an obvious one and a really important one. Biometrics, data security is a real issue, could lead to non um, you know, keeping records to help send people back, and we have seen that at least discussed in the Bangladeshi um, context. If national data legislation is not robust, then it could ha land in the hands of the persecutor and of course mobile data, violations of privacy. Just a couple more things. Um, one, all of this I think might go to is increasing the burden of proof back onto the refugee. So if we have AI in emotion recognition, at what point does that become a lie detector rather than quiet credibility? And then how, that, so then the, the refugee asylum seeker has to prove they're not lying, that's, that's a burden that wasn't there. Data forensics will increase the need for the documentation and the data in the first place. And we know that there are so many reasons why refugees, asylum seekers do not carry those sort of documents. And um, just technical issues, of course. Like that CP1 app that I mentioned before, it's got lots of glitches. Speech and dialect recognition, I don't think you could ever get 100% right. Biometrics does suffer from sample degradation. And actually talked about analyzing social media as part of the credibility in, in the scenario, as part of the credibility assessment. I mean, that's really difficult, highly informal language, may include technical and social slang. I think there's a whole discussion about how life on social media might not actually be real. So that's how do we actually deal with that. And very broadly, there's a big risk that the decision makers will just trust the machine. You know, that computer says no. Um, I think that maybe the decision, human decision maker will trust the machine more than they trust itself. And 
broadly, then moving this tech, then creating a move towards more collective refugee status determination where it's not most advantageous. Well, I feel like I've spoken a lot, so I think I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you. No, th th thanks so much, Neve. I mean, some really, really important points to bear in mind there. I think the, the final one about uh, so that the human in the loop, uh, which is usually the, the excuse that sort of governments use right now to say, don't worry, we use all these AI systems, but there's a human making the final decision, and so it's a deliberate choice to go with that in the scenario we have today. Uh, but, of course, the danger is, Neve, as you say, is that um, they just become a rubber stamp for what the algorithm is doing and then not putting the algorithms to the scrutiny they need to be put under because of that. Ed, do you have a to jump in here? I mean, this is precisely one of the main problems that was called out in the Robodet Royal Commission report. Um, you know, very grateful for the excellent work done by Darren Donovan um, in Melbourne who pointed out that uh, Centrelink, as we all call it colloquially, um, had never employed more people than when they were running robo-debt. Um, in fact, very few debt notices ever went out without um, first a human sort of nominally looking over them first. But the, the problem was there was... It was really sort of a just-for-the-cameras exercise. Those humans who were responsible for those debt notices were not able to go and check the information to determine whether um, the individuals in question actually owed money. And then when they were... You know, receiving calls from the public saying, hold on, I've just got this debt notice for 5000 bucks. I don't know $5,000. All they could do was go, no, 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 the computer says that you owe $5,000. So you, you can have, um, I guess, the veneer of a system that has a human in the loop um, without the reality of it. Sure, yeah. I'm going to give the hand over to you with a very difficult um, proposition, which is, you know, we've talked about all the risks, um, but can you make us a bit more optimistic about what the future holds in this regard uh, by talking about some of the opportunities that a tech provides in the context of um, asylum determinations? Uh, yeah, Daniel, fortunately, I'm an optimist, so uh, <clears throat> this was fine. Uh, look, I can certainly see the appeal of those technologies you mentioned uh, in in the context of primary decision-making, particularly um, border control, it became difficult for me. I was looking through these um, technologies as, as, as they develop to see how they may apply in terms of merits review and judicial review. Uh, but uh, I, when I allow, I guess, my imagination to go wild, I do get excited about the potentials that these um, technologies do pose. And just one thing I wanted to do before uh, doing that is, uh, I wanted to draw a distinction between automated decision making and AI. And the automated decision making that was used in RoboDebt was a very crude tool based on very basic rules that resulted in such a catastrophe. But since then, uh, AI, and should not be confused with automated decision making necessarily, although the latter is a component of it, has developed uh, a great deal. And so the potentials are, uh, are quite wide and, and may be positive. Uh, so in terms of, the, again, the work that I do, uh, I want to talk about three potentials. One is uh, efficiency through data analysis um, and, uh, and provision of up-to-date information. Secondly, uh, research and training. And thirdly, consistency in decision making. So in terms of data analysis, I think there is huge potential uh, to assist decision makers in looking through volumes of information that's presented by applicants to organize them and classify them. This is not necessarily new, but how it's going to be done through more sophisticated AI tools can have uh, profound implications for the way that tribunals and courts uh, do their work. But one aspect of it that is particularly um, I guess striking for me is identifying cases that need to be signposted for prioritization for allocation when you have a massive backlog. For example, how do you identify applicants who have severe mental illness? How do you identify vulnerable women? At the moment, for example, if we want to rely on the antiquated case management tools that we have at, at our disposal, this task can be done, and in fact is being done, uh, 
but it takes a long time. And so I can see huge potentials for us to be able to use AI uh, to be able to prioritize um, cases that need to be prioritized. Uh, in terms of provision of up-to-date information, again, uh, you can just imagine how important it would be for both decision makers and representatives to have access to up-to-date country of origin information. Imagine that you'll be able to ask questions and receive real-time, reliable answers. Uh, this will save time and it will work, hopefully, to the benefit of asylum seekers in most cases if that country information is favorable. Uh, but the area that I'm, I'm excited about is really training because it's something that I uh, recently turned my mind to. And this is training through uh, use of specific technologies and in particular uh, virtual reality technologies. This is by creating simulated environments. And so primarily, for example, this can be used to train decision makers uh, for interviews and hearings so that they can be better equipped uh, to be able to identify vulnerable applicants and to be able to deal with them. At the moment, uh, decision makers, as it's a tribunal, they're provided with training. But whether these traditional forms of trainings are going to be enough to equip decision makers to deal with these kind of situations remains to be seen. Whether AI is going to actually assist us to do this better, that's something I really look forward to. But um, one aspect of VR technology that I was particularly uh, excited about was what if VR can assist uh, decision makers to become more empathetic? What if we can teach empathy to decision makers? And that's by creating virtual realities uh, where real situations are simulated so that the decision maker can put themselves for training purposes in the shoes of another, experiencing different things. What could that mean in terms of debiasing? If um, Kahneman in, in uh, his book Noise, which I'll come to, uh, identifies uh, openly active-minded thinking as probably the identifier of better decision making because it's the type of thinking that acknowledges ignorance and it, it confronts overconfidence in the sense that decision makers are able to identify what it is that they do not know, what it is that they're ignorant about. What if through simulated environments, decision makers are able to have first-hand experience by exposing themselves to real life situations? We can go further than that. You know, putting yourself in the position of someone else. In a, I think, influential study um, by psychologist uh, Barbara Meister, it was, it was actually appeared in an article called Changing Bodies, Changes Minds. Uh, what, uh, what Lara Meister and, uh, sorry, Lara Meister, not Barbara, uh, and her colleagues did, they designed experiments in which participants using VR technologies, they were able to experience embodying uh, different gender, age, race, sexuality. And they found that as a result of this, at least immediately, this resulted in debiasing towards the out group. Now, what if this can be simulated for decision makers? How profound would this impact, uh, would the impact be? Uh, similar experiments have been done in, in Stanford, and one that really piqued my interest was, uh, uh, was an experiment that was run allowing people to put themselves through, again, uh, virtual reality technology in the shoes of a young girl in a refugee camp. Uh, as a result of this experiment, according to the UN, this doubled the donations that were made to the particular refugee fund. So if that kind of interaction, if you're able to actually create that kind of an emotional impact by creating these virtual experiences, then you can imagine what the consequences can be, not just teaching empathy, but debiasing as well. Now, thirdly, consistency. 
which is of particular interest to me. I think it's, um, uh, you know, it also goes to one of those fundamental values of, uh, you know, a, a, a refugee system. It's equality before the law. We have to anticipate that people in similar situations or people with similar cases should receive similar outcomes. I mean, equally different cases should be treated um, differently. Now, how can we do that? And I think um, AI can really assist us with being able to identify uh, where inconsistencies occur and to at least provide some remedies for both courts, courts and tribunals to address inconsistency in decision making. I was listening to a talk by Daniel Kahneman, this predated uh, the publication of the book Noise, and um, for uh, those of you who uh, may not be familiar, Noise is, is essentially a reference to uh, variation in decision making by decision makers in the same organization making similar type decisions. And he was saying that, you know, I'm responsible, this is Kahneman saying that I'm responsible perhaps identifying bias as the biggest source of error, when in fact noise is the biggest source of error in judgments. And he referred to it as being poisonous. And he made this radical suggestion of, you know, if you in fact replace humans with algorithms, then you will probably get rid of noise. And this is because of the discipline and regularity that algorithms bring to, to decision making. That's probably a bit too extreme, but I think uh, you know, uh, in a practical sense, uh, you actually have uh, today AI, you, AI tools being used um, to address inconsistency in judicial decision making. And I think, in particular, um, Daniel Chen and Manuel Ramos Maqueda refer to uh, how AI tools are currently being used for this purpose. Uh, the data and evidence for justice reform du jour, for example, is being used to um, allow harnessing a body of decisions that have been made by a judge uh, to identify where inconsistencies, particularly again using Kahneman's terms, where occasion and pattern noise, where judges show in idiosyncrasies or inconsistencies within, with their own judgment occur so that then through a feedback, this inconsistency can be addressed and then used for training purposes. So these areas really excite me, at least as far as merits review and judicial review are concerned. So I think there's great potential for AI there. Thank you, Shahia, for that um, glimmer of hope and optimism in uh, sort of the responsible use and application of tech in this space. But uh, to that end, Ed, you know, how do we, what, what, yeah, what steps do we need to take to ensure accountability for these new technologies and, and automated decision making uh, in the context of asylum decision making or more broadly in society? Yeah, um, someone once accused me of being the grim reaper of artificial intelligence. I'm certainly not the optimist. I, I'd like to think of myself as, as taking a balanced perspective. Um, but maybe I'll make a couple of observations. The, the, the problem with humans, um, and I say that <laughs> acknowledging that some of my best friends are humans, um, and indeed I am one too. Um, but the problem with humans is the way in which we make decisions can be um, susceptible to all kinds of uh, biases and irrationalities. We know that, right? I don't need to explain that to you. You, you and all that. So th that in turn makes us really vulnerable to someone perhaps wearing a turtleneck um, who says to you, you know what, we've got this amazing technology solution that will de-bias the way in which we make decisions, and it could be any category of decisions you like. And we're vulnerable to that because we have an appropriately humble sense of our own fallibility. We know how we humans can fall into error. And so um, when, when someone offers that, that solution, we, we kind of cling to it, um, you know, grim death. Uh, the, the, the problem, though, is we don't necessarily subject it to the level of scrutiny that we need to because it's got to be better because it's not us, right? And so I just want to zero in on the use of AI in decision-making. Um, and by that, I acknowledge 
some of the definitional points made to my left and my right. Um, but I particularly want to pick up the point that Neve made, which is, um, you know, that machine learning is is really probably the most important hallmark of artificial intelligence. So most forms of uh, of AI based decision making start with a a kind of pool of previous decisions that you train your machine on because of course the the problem with AI is that it doesn't start off as intelligent do you need to train it and in doing that what's incredibly difficult to uh, move away from is that you are ingesting into the machine a whole series of um, previous sort of human frailties, those biases, those prejudices and so on that we're all so concerned about. And so the, the, the difficulty, I guess, in kind of putting too much optimistic hope in AI as a solution to some of the frailties of human decision-making is that the two things are intimately connected. They can, there's, a, there's, a, there's an unbreakable kind of connection between those two things. Um, you're tethered to those previous human decisions. And so you can do all kinds of things to contort yourself to kind of decouple the machine from the human, but they're incredibly difficult and they come with their own risks. So my very much less optimistic view is we've got to be really careful about, um, you know, jumping from one problematic form of decision-making to a different problematic form of decision-making. Um, so... Going to the core of your question, so how do you bring about accountability? So uh, one of the people who's been most influential on me in my journey in AI in the last few years is a, uh, one of the most sort of prominent um, experts in artificial intelligence, a guy called Stuart Russell. Um, he's such a doyen of, of AI that his most famous book is simply called Artificial Intelligence. He's that kind of guy, right? Like, you know, he's got that level of credibility. Um, he gave uh, the Wreath Lectures a couple of years ago, which is like the equivalent of our Boyer Lectures in the UK. And he articulated three new laws for AI. One of them I really want to zero in on because it was truly shocking for um, his colleagues who, you know, on the whole have, have dedicated their entire professional careers to AI. So, so the, the law that he proposed is assume AI fails. Assume that it will fail every time. I think that's really interesting. Not because AI will always fail. Of course it wouldn't. Otherwise, if it did, then we would be a lot less excited about it than, than we all are, or that many of us are. Um, but rather, if you build a decision-making system on the assumption not of infallibility, but rather of the knowledge that it will make mistakes then you are essentially building in a really, really powerful mechanism to ensure accountability, to ensure that uh, where the decision-making system starts to go off the rails, you'll get weak signals that you'll be able to interpret and make sense of, and you'll be able to ensure both individualised justice as well as putting the system itself back on the rails. And that's precisely what we did not do with RoboDebt. I don't mean to harm about RoboDebt, harp on about RoboDebt. But, but we, with RoboDebt, um, we had the exact opposite assumption. We assumed that the system was completely fail-safe. And we also assumed that any individual that claimed, you know, that the system was producing an error was a liar, was a fraud. Um, now, if we keep on making those assumptions... Uh, then we are, we're, we're almost certainly going to create uh, less accountable systems, more systems that are more prone to injustice and, and error. And you know, what, what role does regulation play in this space? And should it be in like general regulation of AI and automated decision making or specific regulation in the context of migration? Yeah, I would, on the whole, I would say the general principle is neither of those things. Um, What's really important to acknowledge is that there are a whole bunch of, um, again, sort of skivvy wearing tech types that are going around saying they're going around at the moment. Have been for the last few years saying we really need regulation for artificial intelligence. We really, really need it. And the truth is, we have a whole bunch of laws. Our, the vast majority of laws that we have are technology neutral, which means that they apply to all technologies and none. And so, for example. Um, if you are 
seeking to make a decision that you're a human and you happen to be making an RSD um, determination uh, and you happen to be um, prejudiced against people from country X. I mean, that is clearly in breach of our existing anti-discrimination legislation. If you had an algorithm that had the same effect, which we, and that's not a hypothetical problem, right? That's a real problem. We suddenly start to question ourselves and we go, oh, is that an ethical problem? No, not at all. It is just as unlawful. But it's only treated as such if we make sure that we enforce the law in respect of those algorithmic or AI-informed decisions. So frankly, the very first most important thing we could do to ensure that AI doesn't lead to greater levels of injustice is to enforce the bloody law that we have right now, right? To just do it really effectively and to resist the kind of siren song of people, you know, who may be well-meaning, but often I think are probably being a little bit disingenuous, saying we really need to have a very, very long debate about what our regulation for AI should look like. Um, because for every moment that we're having those very, very long debates, essentially uh, that, that allows um, companies, governments to act as if there's no law at all. And that's just not true. Thanks, Ed. And we have a, a question from the audience that goes, that touches on some of the points you were making there. Um, and so the question is, will judicial review of migration decisions in future include arguments about flaws in coding algorithms and inherent biases and other issues with AI tech? Yes, is the short answer. I mean, there's, there's a really interesting um, decision uh, about 18 months ago, um, not in the refugee space. It was uh, Rod Sims, when he was the head of the ACCC, took a case um, against Trivago, which is a travel website. Um, some of you may be aware of this story, but I'll just quickly run it through with you because I think it's really instructive. It's a, it's a globally significant test case um, that happens to have been here in Australia. Um, so in that case, um, Trivago, I'm sure you've all had this experience, you, you're going on a holiday somewhere, um, and you put in your details and it'll tell you, okay, you know, when you go to Coffs Harbour, here are the top 10 hotels based on what you need. Um, what the ACCC got the impression, or got a tip off um, about was that, no, they were ranked on the basis of the size of the commission that Trivago got. Um, Trivago claimed, no, no, couldn't possibly be that. No, definitely, no, definitely not. And also, we're never going to show you our algorithm or our training data or anything like that because that's our secret source. You know, we're really worried that the ACCC might leak that information or set up its own travel. I don't know what they're worried about. <laughs> Some crazy stuff, right? Um, and the ACCC was really clear. And they go, no, we're the regulator. We, we'll take that information, thanks. And they fought it really, really hard. They fought it all the way to the full bench of the federal court. And, I mean, it was, you know, I think really obvious. It was like sort of, you know, Anyway, it, it, was, it, was, uh, it was the judicial equivalent of saying this is a stupid kind of argument, but they put it more nicely than that. Um, and then, lo and behold, uh, the ACCC was suddenly the dog that caught the car. So they, they, they got all of this incredibly detailed information, a whole, it's like the equivalent of getting like pages and pages of ones and zeros. And then they go, oh God, what do we do with this, right? We've got the algorithms, plural, and we've got all this training data, but how do we make sense of it? And that was a really, really difficult problem, right? So the, the, the next step was interesting because they didn't have um, a, a team of technical experts who are employed by the ACCC who could actually make sense of it and determine whether the law was uh, being breached or not. So instead, they had to um, uh, contract with Quantium, which is Australia's largest sort of um, you know, AI company for gun for hire, um, and uh, working with them, they were able to determine precisely what happened. And, you know, just to ruin the story for you, um, it turns out that Trivago was indeed uh, kind of, um, you know, acting uh, in their own commercial interests rather than the interests of their customers. Um, but the, the, the point from that is, um, I guess, twofold. One is we now have a really clear um, judgment from the full bench of the federal court uh, that a decision maker can't keep that information from the regulator or from a court. Um, two, uh, if you get that information, you've, you've, you've still got another challenge, right? Um, so one can imagine if you are a, um, an individual, as, as is the case with uh, refugee um, decision making, the, the idea of being able to 
you know, really get the expert evidence that you need to be able to interrogate um, that, um, that, that data is, is incredibly difficult to imagine being realistic. Um, so if there is an area of reform that's really important, it is perhaps a, a, an amendment to the Acts Interpretation Act to say, look, you know, if you've got a statutory right to reasons, you can't just give someone, you know, this massive um, pile of, of virtual paper. You actually have to give them the means to be able to undertake a technical assessment. Um, Catherine, can I turn to you for um, your views on the regulation point? Um, sure, thanks, Dan. Um, I wanted to just pick up that idea that we have a lot of law in this field, and, and I think we can see that because if you take a wider view, a lot of the use of these technologies, in particular around algorithmic decision-making, not just in migration and asylum, but more widely, have been successfully contested using domestic administrative law principles. Um, privacy, for example, um, in the case of mobile phone data extraction, that's been condemned by courts in the UK and in Germany, um, but um, other aspects of administrative law also. And it's something in the AFAR project we're, we're going to try to map with a, um, and actually develop a tool, a, a database to have um, an overview of these kind of contestations. Obviously, there is specific legislation on AI as a product being uh, drafted as we speak at the EU level, and it would uh, categorize AI, certain AI uses in migration asylum and as high risk. Um, but I think more, more salient are general procedural rules for the asylum sphere, and also, as I mentioned, general, general administrative law principles. Um, but I wanted to just maybe step back a little bit, because I think what we haven't maybe mentioned is that unlike, say, in criminal justice, in the asylum context, we do have, you know, uh, just, I think, a, a, a fundamental lack of settled principles for evidential assessment in general. And I've been really convinced by Hilary Evans Cameron's work in this field um, about our lack of uh, stable risk assessment principles. And I think no matter, no amount of automation can overcome bigger kind of questions about how do we assess evidence in this field? Um, and, and, and the second big caveat I would make is that in reality, I think a lot of the reasons why asylum decision making is really challenging is because refugees are, have generally been illegalized, especially if you're looking at European systems. So the reason people have destroyed their documents is because they've taken the advice of smugglers. The reason people you know, are often completely depleted is because they've made long, dangerous journeys and they're extra traumatized because of that. And I think we have to bear that in mind, you know, that a lot of the time, the idea of building this very complex machinery to assess asylum claims just seems, in some ways, I'm very uncomfortable with this idea because of the fact that, you know, we're dealing with people that have been traumatized by these containment practices. And now we're going to double down on tech rather than actually saying, well, look, how could you make an asylum system where people are less traumatized in the first place? Um, I do think there are often individual positive tools that can be designed. So I think preference matching is potentially really great for allocating asylum seekers and refugees to places where they would thrive or even have agency in choosing. Um, I think the judicial nudges sometimes could be very usefully designed so that just judges and decision makers are aware of patterns of decision making. But the reality is we don't really see that much investment in tools that would be positive for decision makers and for applicants, because a lot of this technology is about, um, you know, confirming suspicions that people are not the nationality they claim or, um, or really doubling down on um, you know, some of the more exclusionary practices and, and technology. These tools are often at this stage, I think, especially in asylum, just being designed to confirm suspicions. So, you know, at a certain point in time, European decision makers were accepting most Syrian applicants. And then all of a sudden there's this real concern. Oh, OK, now because we're accepting most Syrian applicants, we have more people pretending to be Syrian. So we have to do dialect analysis or we think some uh, nefarious people have gotten hold of Syrian passport machines. So now we have to double down on checking the authenticity of documents. So they're often, you know, devised in this very reactive mode and they don't, nobody's really stepping back and saying, well, look, why is it that asylum decision makings become so complex? Um, so, yeah, I think, um, I think we have to be attentive to those concerns as well. 
Uh, thank you, Catherine. That's a, a, a great segue um, and nudge for me to move on from um, the tech component of this scenario. I think I've shown my um, own uh, human biases uh, by, by focusing on one of the areas that I was most interested in. Uh, but the, the scenario does contain other elements, particularly um, focusing on other modalities uh, beyond individual RSD for identifying people in need of protection. And um, so, Catherine, I want to stick with you and uh, ask you about so this greater role for group determination in this scenario. And you know, it's something that's happening in some contexts already. And um, you know, what the benefits you think of that approach are, and in what context the use of group de determinations are appropriate. Well, in our work in the RefMIG project on this, I've always been influenced by Jean-François Duria's take, which is to highlight that there's always an element of group assessment in all asylum determination because, you know, persecution is on shared grounds or the risk is shared by other applicants and we're generalizing based on what we know about country of origin conditions. Um, but if we think more formally about group-based mechanisms, you know, they're pervasive. I would say most people who benefit from international protection probably do so on the basis of some sort of group-based practice especially if we take into account prima facie declarations in Africa. Um, but it's really not one or the other. So even in African states, mostly what you find is certain populations will have benefited from a prima facie declaration um, and an individualized process is often exists to decide if the person belongs to that group. And you'll have some kind of individualized process for other applicants. So it's a very sort of patchy practice and it's a tool that's used by states. I think if we look more widely, let's say the practices in Latin America that have arisen out of Venezuelan displacement, there you do get very generalized group-based statuses, but often more ad hoc or once-off statuses, sometimes with you know, very significant rights attaching to them. For example, the status which Venezuelan displaced persons have enjoying Colombia, which is a 10-year residence permit with the right to work. Um, and of course, the biggest one of contemporary significance is the formal temporary protection for Ukrainian, uh, for people who fled Ukraine after the Russian invasion. And there, I think that was, you know, based on an EU legal instrument, as probably most people are aware, that was adopted after the Balkan Wars, um, but never activated uh, since it was adopted. Indeed, the EU uh, had shelved this legal instrument for abolition, saying it was completely uh, unrealistic to envisage it would ever be used uh, just months before it was, which is a nice example to bear in mind when we were scenario planning. Um, and I think there, you know, you get all the advantages, you know, everybody who flees enjoys protection, but it's temporary. And in the case of the temporary protection directive, extremely temporary. Um, and of course, then the determination of whether that status is going to continue is one that's made at the highest political level at the EU, which makes it very uncomfortable for an, from an individual rights point of view. Um, so I think when we've tried to map these practices, what we've tried to do is be attentive to who decides. Often group-based determinations involve high-level political determinations rather than judicialized or you know, formal adjudication. Um, and sometimes they come with some rights restrictions or fewer rights than formal refugee status. That's obviously of concern, but not always. Um, and I think there, I think on the rights side of it, on the quality of the status question, I think we always have to be careful about what are we comparing with? Are we comparing with the ideal in the Refugee Convention plus international human rights law, which refugees don't enjoy in reality uh, in many, I would say most states in the world, in which case you would say often these kind of alternative statuses fall short, or are we comparing with you know, the reality for even recognized convention refugees, which is often rights restriction as well. So, um, but I think those practices are out there and what they show is that, I think it's really, um, it's both the fact that these kind of practices are, I think, important just to understand them empirically because they're there, um, and that was the motivation in the beginning in the RefMeg project. Um, but also they tell us something very important about refugeehood and that it doesn't have to only be determined on an individualized basis. Because often in both doctrinal refugee law and in bureaucratic practice, the emphasis on the individual isn't rights protective. 
actually it's all it's sometimes about singling out and exceptionality and kind of a mode of exclusion so i think that was the other reason that i was always interested in these practices more normatively thanks catherine and then sticking um, on the sort of different modalities there was also a big focus on kind of streaming into different procedures in the scenario so whether that's into um yeah, accelerated procedures or fast track procedures uh, and obviously that's something that's happening to a certain degree already um, and i just wanted your views on the you know whether our circumstances where such streaming is appropriate and you know what safeguards need to be in place I think very crudely, uh, streaming strong decisions into fast tracks for swift positive determination seems to be a fairly easy win-win, um, where it would benefit states and refugees. And so from that seems, I mean, maybe there are some concerns about exclusion one would want to be mindful of, but in general, I think fast tracking strong, apparently, you know, evidently strong claims, if we can figure that out well, Seems like a win-win. Obviously, most of the practice is on the other side of the coin. Most of the practices we see are about streamlining claims and uh, based on a, presumptions about a putative safe country of origin or more commonly some kind of mishmash of admissibility and unfoundedness concerns. So what we find there, and this is what Europe has been doing for decades now, um, tends to be both really suspect from a procedural fairness point of view and an accuracy point of view, but also very counterproductive. So I'm pretty sure at this stage that most of the ostensible procedures that are introduced to accelerate claims end up lengthening the overall asylum process because people go to get out of any fast track that's going to lead to a rejection. If they have an, a lawyer at all or any way to get out of the process, then they will bring an appeal if they can do that. Um, if we look at the inadmissibility practices in Greece, for example, where virtually all claims are inadmissible, nobody is removed to Turkey anymore. So people just try to bring fresh claims over and over again, unless they give up on asylum altogether. Um, so we have really, you know, so I'm very skeptical very often based in particular about the European experience about the practices that we label accelerated because they might get you to a quick rejection at first instance, but they certainly don't do anything to make the asylum system overall more efficient. Yeah, thank you, Catherine. I mean, that's very much been our experience here in Australia too with our so-called fast-track system for processing asylum claims, which was anything but fast, was ended up being much slower, uh, not only unfair, but just much slower than the regular system. And uh, I think maybe the, tying that back to our uh, kind of initial discussion around the values that inform the design of uh, asylum oh. systems. Um, you know, fairness and efficiency are often flagged as being intention, but in reality, particularly in legal systems where you have um, the options for you know, robust review of decisions, uh, any, when you overstretch, when you try and increase efficiency by curtailing rights, it can end up backfiring um, and actually leading to longer, longer delays. Uh, we might turn to questions from the audience now. I've had a few come through already on Slido, but you can, uh, we'll also take some questions from the audience in a moment. And um, you know, there, I know there's quite a few practicing immigration lawyers in the audience, and uh, I, guess the, the, I guess the general question is, you know, what does this all mean um, for, for, for people practicing in this space? Um, but also the specific question that someone from the audience had was, can and should refugee lawyers use AI to assist refugees in the RSP process? I'm happy to have a swing at the second question. I mean, yes, but carefully, maybe. So, I mean, there are some um, products or from companies that you would recognize, like LexisNexis, that increasingly integrating AI in, um, into you know, case management and, and so on tools. Um, and on the whole, um, some of those, those tools are, are, are really carefully designed. Um, we've been doing some work recently with um, the Victorian Legal Services Commissioner, the, the regulator for, for lawyers in, in Victoria, on the rise of generative AI, so things like ChatGPT. Um, what would be one of the most common and most worrisome kind of um, trends is, and this is 
particularly common among junior lawyers, right? You have as an open tab chat GPT and you just constantly ask it questions over the course of the day. That's really, really dangerous. Please don't ever do that. that there will almost certainly be a whole bunch of people who will lose their pra practicing certificate for doing that. Um, just to give you two reasons why not to do it. One, um, we know that these, uh, these applications um, hallucinate. They, they make up stuff. There was quite famously recently a New York lawyer who was very late in putting, putting together his written submissions for court um, and so got ChatGPT to do it. It sounded very plausible what, what it came up with um, and it made up a whole bunch of cases. I mean, it would be helpful if those cases existed, but they happened not to. Um, and then the other danger, of course, well, there are many dangers. And another danger is whenever you're inputting your client's personal information into ChatGPT, you're handing that over to a number of companies, including OpenAI and Microsoft, in a way that you shouldn't, you're not allowed to, right? So, you, so being really cautious about that, I think, is, is, is very important. So we are, at the Caldor Data Lab, we are working on this right now, precisely a tool to assist um, lawyers, uh, refugee lawyers, represent their clients, and uh, it, basically what it will be, uh, the data's already there, we're just working on presenting it in a way that's accessible um, to lawyers rather than the Excel spreadsheet and pivot tables we have right now, um, but uh, basically it gives you insights into each individual judge and each individual tribunal member about how they've decided, so past cases, um, based on various different characteristics um, and what we're working on exploring using generative AI for this purpose is also what, you know, for, for, for example, for judicial review, what, what sort of cases, which cases does the judge often cite when uh, deciding in favor of the applicant, what cases does it cite when, it goes, when, when, when they go the other way. Um, and so very much kind of mimicking the proprietary judicial analytics tools that um, Ed mentioned uh, but I guess the concern there is if we leave the development of these tools in the hands of sort of big companies, um, the risk is it further increases the uh, access to justice gap. And uh, very soon it's not going to be um, no, um, no, how much money you have to pay for a lawyer and how expensive your lawyer is, um, but whether your lawyer can ex uh, afford these exorbitant fees to get access to this judicial analytics, which gives them an edge. So trying to create open access versions of these tools, I think is very, very important for access to justice. Um, this is just something I came across as I was doing some reading, is Daniel Chen's research in the US um, immigration context, where just by knowing the, uh, the name of the judge and the country of nationality, uh, his team could predict with 80% accuracy the outcome of the case. Now, the proposition there was that, well, this could um, assist representatives in being better prepared for the outcome that is so easily predicted. Well, I'm not really sure if <clears throat> that's always possible in every jurisdiction. Uh, one other thing I just wanted to come back to, Ed, uh, I think between the uh, optimists and the pessimists, we are in furious agreement in the sense that I think uh, there is probably a... Um, a danger in kind of transporting ourselves from now to a jettison-like era. And I certainly don't imagine decision-making completely being, uh, you know, designated to some AI-type model to be made. And in fact, the three areas where I felt that this could be of great assistance to decision-makers is through assistive technology. And I think if we frame it in that way, that these tools are there to assist us in making better decisions, uh, not just in, in terms of asylum decisions, but general, generally in terms of decision-making as human beings, this is where we can really capitalize on without really abrogating responsibility for decision-making, but utilizing the sophistication that these tools give us to be able to make better decisions, and I don't see why others, including representatives, can use these as assistive tools to be able to do them. Uh, I was listening to a lecture by Amy Webb, who's the CEO of, um, I think, the Future Today Institute, and they published the um, uh, tech trends for the next 10 years. And I think she's absolutely right that it, you know, it will become impossible for us to think on our own. 
And uh, while I totally agree with you, Ed, that it, it has to, you know, we have to be very, very careful in doing that kind of not alone thinking on an everyday basis through chat GPT. We also have to be aware that this technology is um, advancing at an amazing rate. For example, perplexity does the same thing as chat GPT does, except that it actually gives you the sources where that information came from. This can be a hugely assistive tool in terms of, for example, knowing uh, the situation in a country where you don't have any idea about what's going on. Uh, I noticed that only recently, Bing, which, which also uses now ChatGPT in every response that's generated is also incorporating references. While these references are limited at the moment, I can just see that in next, next year or, or, or you know, in two years time, you know, the resourcing will become more sophisticated. So um, I guess it's a, it's a fine balance, isn't it, to yeah. make sure that we're not really uh, rejecting this kind of technology because of its dangers, but also not, as our keynote speaker said, embracing quick fixes because yeah. it's feasible for us to do so. Just 30 seconds. So safe experimentation is really good. Um, so I'm definitely not saying, you know, throughout all the machines. Um, but, and I agree with you, the, there's a world of difference between handing over responsibility to the machine and assistive technology. But in doing that, we must remember the point that Neve made, which is, and there's a $3 term for this, is that the term is algorithmic deference. So you're, in theory, it's just a piece of assistive technology. It's just giving you a recommendation. But in practice, a lot of the time, um, what people end up doing is they just defer to the machine. They don't check the workings. They don't do any of that That sort of really important legwork. Um, and so that's the thing that is really, really important to kind of maintain a bright line between assistive technology and, and kind of automated decision-making. But, I mean, this goes back to the society of transparency and, you know, knowing what technologies are being used, how they're being used, but then also data on what types of decisions they're making. Like, for example, in that scenario, if you had data, clear data on the number of, the percentage of times each individual decision maker over, overturned whatever decision the computer told them, that would give you really good insights into whether they are actually bringing an open mind to the question or not. We've got some great questions still coming in on Slido. I'm, I'm, I'll take one more from Slido and then maybe one or two from the audience. Um, so one of the questions from Slido is about the role of private corporations. And um, so technology is produced to the specs and demands of the buyer, i.e. the government. At what point should technology businesses have to say no to avoid human rights abuses? I don't know. You, no, I mean, I think this is probably one that you should talk to, but I mean, I, at, at the beginning... Like, I think, yeah, that's, I, I don't know that there's a point. I mean, this is, this is like it always. So, yeah, that's probably all I wanted to say. I, I think you can speak to this more, but it just seems like always from the beginning. Yeah, I don't know. I, I definitely agree with that. I mean, I think um, some big tech companies have um, drawn a few lines in the sand. Um, facial recognition is a really important example of that, where even companies like Meta um, have said, no, we're pulling back from this area of technology because we're really worried about its use, especially by um, governments, not just, you know, the quote-unquote authoritarian governments, but liberal democratic governments in ways that, that can cause really serious harm. Um, but to my mind, that's a really flimsy protection. Uh, you know, corporations legitimately are there to maximise their profit. So to rely as your only line of defence on companies sort of pulling back from um, from offering that sort of technology as a service, I think is is, is really limited. So that, that is an area that I think is calling out for stronger regulation. Should we open up to the audience? Brian? Thank, <clears throat> thanks. Um, so we spent a lot of the discussion talking about technology, but technology is very much on the side of the government and the imbalance of power between the two parties is so tremendous. What can we do to give the applicant more power in the process? Thanks. Um, I could start. So I think this might um, I could speak to the role of the immigration lawyer here. 
um, and the importance of the immigration lawyer in what they, so this is obviously, yeah, not directly the applicant but the lawyer. Um, the lawyer needs to push back, I believe, the importance of the lawyer needs to push back on those sort of technologies that are increasing the burden of proof onto the applicant. Um, so I mentioned that before as a potential risk. That's what lawyers need to do and to remind decision makers, officials of the legal standards. Now, we do have the issue of different legal standards in different jurisdictions, but there are some fundamentals, burden of proof, and also the duty of shared fact-finding as well. Um, that, that's, it's a duty between the official and, and the refugee. And so to ensure that those kinds of things are happening. Um, and, yeah, so I think, yeah, for me, the, the lawyer's role in accountability um, and ensuring that, I suppose, that, um, you know, questioning costs and, and thinking about out outcomes and impacts, especially on vulnerable humans. So, yeah, the importance of the lawyer in pushing back and sort of thinking about also how to make the legal argumentation in judicial review, et cetera. Any more questions from the audience? Hi, fascinating panel. Thanks to all the speakers. Natasha from um, UNSW. I've got a question. Um, it relates to the scenario. So um, if we can uh, look forward to 2033 and we can say, okay, the nature of uh, protection challenges will change, it will evolve as it does, and AI will play a role as it will. Um, and then we ask who is um, driving the role and um, that, that AI will play. And considering that we want to move, uh, you know, as researchers in, in refugee law, we want to move um, towards um, the values that we mentioned at the beginning, so fairness and, and a greater notion of human dignity. So maybe emphasising care alongside, you know, securitisation in the way that we're doing refugee status determination, as an example, or um, looking at um, gender claims in an intersectional way, not just through a narrow lens of um, as, as they are now. Um, what would you say to researchers then um, to, you know, what, what, what would be the key areas um, for scholarship or for scholars to focus on in order to move um, or to help RSD to evolve um, using technology further towards those values? So before, before we jump to that, Natasha, you're taking over my chairing roles because that was the, the final question that I was going to put to the panel. Um, so I'll just, so maybe, maybe I'll, so Natasha's question about what we need to so the same question we had for the end of the last panel. What's the one thing we need to understand better? And so what we should be researching and focusing on? And what uh, the one intervention is that we should make now in order to, to avoid the worst and amplify the best of that possible future we discussed today? Do you want me to start? To okay, yeah. Um, so the, when you asked about the, the one thing we had to understand better, uh, one thing that I used to think about in this in this regard is that we have to understand that the tech isn't going anywhere, but I actually think we do all understand that. But I, I say that because I think when I first started talking about this, there was kind of a horrified, um, you know, a horrified reaction as to how can you bring in tech into something where, where there's such human vulnerability. Um, but it's clear that the tech is here, and so it's very important that we, I guess, have a sort of a clear eye about that. But in regards to the intervention, I actually took, um, inspiration from our keynote this morning and thinking is that we have to insist and help facilitate refugee voice here. I don't think we should be doing anything, like we, we can't just use that as a placard. You know, we just have to actually say at what, at, you know, at, at all points there has to be refugee voice and, and um, really tapping into the refugee strengths that are, are so I just think that that's, I don't know how you make sure that happens, but I think we have to be very mindful of that from now and stop making the, and don't continue to make these decisions or have these discussions without refugees. Catherine? Um, I think in terms of understanding better, I think there's a lot more work to be done about the institutional design of asylum systems, especially sort of at a regime level. So looking at both like everything from whether people claim or register 
to the RSD, the first instance, to an appeal if it exists. It doesn't exist if UNHCR is the decision maker. But we know a lot now that the institutional design has a huge impact on outcomes. Um, one uh, feature in particular, which has been partly studied only in Europe but not globally, is that if UNHCR is on the decision-making body, which it is in many states around the world, in the national decision-making body, recognition rates happen to be higher. Um, and there are also some uh, multi-panel decision-making bodies where you have civil society members involved. There's no reason we couldn't imagine refugee status determination being done with refugee community organizations having, a, you know, at least a monitoring role. But I think, you know, just thinking a bit more about the institutional design, not just the uh, legal procedures themselves, but who decides in whose name. And maybe the second intervention would be to just to decenter individual interviews. I mean, I think they're just a really bad, they're, they're really um, problematic for applicants, um, especially the way that we tend to institutionalize them in, as far as I'm aware, Australia, New Zealand, uh, certainly across Europe, in, I mean, crudely in the global north. Um, and they often don't extract useful information. They're often, and credibility isn't you know, we use it so often as a reflex for describing what goes on in asylum determination. But, you know, we shouldn't be making all things considered determinations about a human being's credibility or not at all. It's not pertinent to their asylum claim. So so I think we really have to kind of shake it up a little bit. Um, your scenario referred to, you know, people won't get a robust individualized assessment. And that made me cringe a bit saying, well, when I think about individualized assessment in this mode, I don't think of that as robust. I think of that as uh, re-traumatizing, not a source of accurate and probative evidence very often. And so I really would want to shift the focus a bit more into like, what do we know about the risks people face based on the objective evidence available back for, of countries of origin? And that that can very often lead to at least a presumption of inclusion. And then people should be treated as presumptive refugees if we need to do a more individualized process. Um, so we're, we're at a real crossroads, which I know is a cliche, but we, we really are. There's um, big decisions that governments are making, including uh, the Australian federal government, on uh, the way in which they use AI and other new and emerging technology for decisions. And there's huge money flowing in, right? There's enormous incentives on uh, corporate Australia and, and multinational corporations to really supercharge that change. That change is not necessarily a bad thing. I don't want to say that. But it is unmistakable, and I have to be really clear about this. Um, I can't think of another liberal democracy with a less engaged civil society and academic community. And that's not to say that there aren't some, you know, civil society and academic folk who aren't very, very engaged, and I'm sure many of them are represented here, but um, then often not given, or not taking a seat at the table. Um, we need leading civil society and academic voices to really be stepping in on this, because all government at the moment is hearing from time to time is often, well, look, just make sure you give human rights consideration and whatever you're doing over there, we, we, we actually need a bit more um, involvement from those academic and, and civil society voices. Yeah, I'd like to continue on from Ed and, and really emphasize that in order to do that, we really need to ask important questions. First is the context. Are we asking in what context AI is being deployed? Is it a high risk situation? Does it apply to vulnerable people, as Nim said. And secondly, the question that actually perplexes me is ultimately those people who are responsible for reviewing those decisions, do they understand what has actually uh, been involved in, in the type of tools and the type of mechanisms or the technology that has resulted in those decisions being made? That really frightens me when I think about the bench, for example when would they be able to get the capacity to actually understand the technology involved so that they can engage in a proper review of a decision that may have relied on an unexplainable AI? That's a really critical thing that I don't think we engage enough because we are too caught up with the technology itself. But I just 
wanted to go back to my, uh, I guess, message of optimism and maybe um, end with a quote uh, from Orly Lobel, her excellent book, which is called uh, The Equality Machine. And she says, we find ourselves at a crossroads, poised on the precipice of a profound paradigm shift. Let us be inspired by all the positive potential to embrace AI to create a bigger, future, brighter future. Storytelling matters. If all the stories we hear about technology focus on the harm technology poses to the vulnerable, why would anyone want to enter the field to make it better? What a wonderful note to finish on. Please uh, join me in thanking the panel. And uh, we'll break for afternoon tea now, and uh, I'll see, we'll see you all back here at 2.50 uh, p.m. for our third panel on Will Refugees Be Welcome? <laughs>